You're listening to the Emerging Futures podcast with Joe Mardell. In this episode, I spoke with Samantha Matthews, the CEO and CTO of Loci, a location-based safety training course creator that generates gamified content based on your environment. Loci's powerful game engine builds custom learning experiences that empower people with stronger recall in times of emergency. Thanks for coming along today, Sam. It's really great to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to it as well. I always uh, love an opportunity to talk about the future. Absolutely. That's what this podcast is all about. But before we talk about the future, why don't you just give us an introduction into your career and how you've ended up working in the emerging tech space? Sure. Yeah, I um, well, I come from a really small island in the Pacific Northwest in Canada, and uh, it had like 600 people on it. I was the only kid in my grade and uh, we shared a party line. So like one household or like four households for one phone line. And so uh, when I moved to the city and like all of a sudden there was like 80 kids in my grade, my age, um, it was just really interesting because I was like, just came from a place where connection and my world was so small and quiet to like getting the internet and then like getting a cell phone when I'm 17 that's like I can play snake on and just coming up growing up with in in the exponential curve of uh emerging sort of communication and connected tech and so uh that just uh I think I'm I was born and grew up at a very special time and uh those things really um impacted um my sort of idea of how what I could do in the world and who I could connect to and I uh, was always really into music and so I had um, went to sound audio engineering school and learned how to you know mix and make music and produce music through different programs so that was kind of my introduction to software hardware and uh, dongles and all the weird things you used to have to use to make things and uh, and I really fell in love with electronic music and producing music. So I uh, became a DJ and I toured all over the world, went to the Rebel Music Academy in 2006 and uh, played, had a residency in Berlin and just really was like living that life. And um, around 2012, was it 2011, the Coachella did the live stream. um, And there was a a thing out of the UK called Boiler Room that was doing like live streaming underground parties. I got really taken with live streaming and this idea that like, cause I miss a lot of my friends and people when I was on the road all the time and I wanted to give people the experience of being on stage with me. So I started looking into it and ended up finding this GoPro hacking community that, uh, and this guy that was streaming college basketball games to these really high-end broadcast mixers, these really cheap, mountable cameras and um, so I was able to figure out a way to create a live stream broadcast that was Coachella broadcast quality for around four grand um, and at the time those were costing around 100 grand and so I uh, walked into a YMCA and asked them if they had any adult accounting classes so I could learn how to start a business and they said, uh, you know, we, we actually, how old are you? And I was just at the cutoff for the, to be in this young entrepreneur program that if you came up with a viable business plan they, and presented and pitched, you could get five grand to start your business. So I did and I got that. And that was sort of my, okay, now I can get this piece of equipment that I've been renting and, and make a go of this. And so I started... And it was at the same time that Hootsuite had started in Vancouver and they were a uh, social media dashboard and social media m- metrics. And so um, you could start to see things online, like the demographics of a show that was sold out. And so I was able to kind of come up with a model where I'd go to liquor brands or brands and agencies that represented brands that would take 
the want the same to reach the same audience and I say hey like why don't you pay for this live stream and then the band reaches more people I get paid everybody wins and so that I started doing that and that brought me down to LA um, partnered with a big ticketing company and uh, I just by chance through the same GoPro hacking community uh, saw people making 360 cameras and I'd had the pleasure of trying like the developer kit of Oculus and so I was like oh cool like 360 like the whole point of my business was to help people connect and feel like they were on stage with people because GoPros you can put them on like a guitar you know you can put them on like a drum kit and so you're getting these really amazing broadcasting experiences but it's still not the same as like 360 and being completely immersed on the stage right and looking around and so um found someone who'd made their own camera I was like let's just shoot a music video for me and if it sucks like who cares we can learn the technology and we found somebody who created those uh kind of segue style iPad robots that were for like telepresence. And they, we convinced them to like lend us one so we could mount our camera on that and like control it with a robot. Where we were shooting in LA, this uh, sort of unused gallery, this kid came in that was just straight out of a movie hacker, hacker movie. And uh, he was like, enthralled by our 360 robot and he was like hey well he pulled like this makeshift homemade VR headset out of his backpack and he's like is these none of it no no headsets have come out at this point right no not even google cardboard and so um we're like he's like hey I have 3d scanned this gallery you're shooting in want to check it and I'm making like a, a mixed reality art gallery and I'm like well what do you know okay cool and so I like check it out and and I, and I realized I was like, and he'd used a Tango, like a scanner, which was also still a development kit from Google. I'm not sure if you're familiar, it's, it's no longer an active project, but it was one of the first act, uh, laser photogrammetry devices. And so uh, he, he showed me this really trippy art gallery he'd made in this space. And I was like, can I put my bubble in your space or can you put your thing in my bubble and can we combine these two files and he's like yeah we can i was like okay great what do you need he's like just a deposit and i was like i might never see this money again like i just like gave this kid a deposit and then two weeks later he came to my office and he's like okay your music video is not really a music video it's like a club on the internet i'm like what and he's like yeah like when you go there you'll be present like you'll have an avatar and like you'll be in the music video I'm like, what are you talking about and I was like what program is this he's like it's a browser and so I'm like this looks like a game engine and he's like yeah it's a game engine on the browser and so it was this brand new project out of the University of Toronto called Janus VR which was like uh, this guy uh, Dr. James McRae's master's thesis that his teacher, Dr. Kran Singh was so taken with, they like founded a company, went through Y Combinator, and it was just a browser reimagined in 3D, right? Using WebGL. And um, so it was really cool because it wasn't just combining like you have, you know, a website is a room, a link is a portal, right? Or a door and, and you have presence and you can chat and you can talk and you can follow each other around and you can have bots and you can visualize cookies and you can see everything that you that exists as 2d on the web and even the things that are invisible you can make you can make visible so um they had already done a 360 live stream inside of like a rendered copy of this famous little bar on sunset in la and like all these people were flying in and out of the live streams as avatars. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, clearly I need to focus hundred percent on this. Cause this is like the, the dream 10 years in the future. Right. And so I, uh, I just completely pivoted to focusing on, on WebXR and it was really early. Like, like, like I said, before headsets were coming out yet. And so my idea of what VR was, was the metaverse right off the bat. Right. Like it wasn't like, oh, we're going to have these apps and people are going to like raise a hundred million dollars and buy foosball tables and like burn the money to the ground and like make these things no one sees. Like I hadn't gone through that whole experience of like a, a curve of a new technology coming out. And, and here I was right at the bleeding edge. But then what happened was 
Facebook built a browser, a 3D browser, you know, and, and Samsung built a 3D browser. And then all of a sudden I'm sharing stages at Unity conferences and stuff with the people of these massive companies. And I'm like, I was a DJ, <laughs> like this was not where I anticipated myself ending up, you know, but at the same time I was, uh, my company uh, event agency was the first throwing commercial money into use cases and being like, hey, can you do this? And so it was very much like paying to develop open source tools, but then having those become use cases that I could prove out business ideas with. And one of the big ones was like when we started working directly with Janice was, hey, we all need to meet in this place so we can eat our dog food and say if it works, you know, like if I, it's a lot easier for me to sell this to someone if I'm like, I'm in here all day with my coworkers, you know? And so we did, built a lot of cool tools and just spent all day in there. And I still am like yearning to get back to that kind of type of co-working where like your Keanu, your sad Keanu Reeves one day and somebody's showing you this giant building that they made. And it's just like wild, you know? Um, but through that experience, I just, I really focused on, um, I was able to sort of prove out a prototype of uh, hosting these photogrammetry spaces is on tiny web servers, like smaller than Raspberry Pis, um, that were just basically you could plug into the wall, like the size of a USB, and it's like a little private internet. So you can use your device, use your own browser, type anything in the top, and it'll just redirect you to the local network. And there you can kind of share this space. So I was really obsessed with like creating a digital twin of a space hosted in the same space that anyone could connect to. And I became really obsessed with this idea that like spaces should be able to like share what is most important about them for you as the person in there. Like they should be able to tell you what you need to know. And, and we should just have like sort of these basic versions like a contractor version, a city version. It's so really this idea emerged in my, my mind of the connection of people to space and how that could kind of like you know people were working on all these cool like gaming things and metaverse stuff but i just i just sort of felt like what what triggered in my mind was like i felt closer to spaces that i had captured into these time capsules and closer to the spaces i was already in because i had another version of them that i could like store new layers of information in and this idea that maybe like my friend could pop into my house and write something on my whiteboard wall. And like this idea of kind of persistence of information and, and where information is stored because like, does it need to be in the cloud if it's about a place that you're in? Like it doesn't really need to be. So then really became obsessed with like the idea of edge networks and mesh networks and what it would mean to kind of create other webs of information that are hyper contextual. And so uh, that kind of took me to this use case of like, okay, I'll scan a building. I'll find a way to create spatial anchors of it, like be it through city data um, of like other databases that anchor information. And then, you know, Microsoft has spatial anchors now. So um, that's kind of getting like that, that's better than anything I, I could create. Uh, so there's ways to actually anchor, you know, um, copies sort of like physical maps of places to that place so AR can uh, be accurate, right? But the way of doing that is still very like top down from the cloud, you know, versus like, well, what if you just had one pin and one copy of that place, but it gets into this interesting sort of edge of between infrastructure, private and public information. And so um, what I found was that really there's, if you want something to become a piece of infrastructure and not just some siloed platform on Google or something that becomes like Google Home or something that's all this data for self-driving cars about cities, it's not actually like, can, it's not put into file formats or into places that other people can use, right? And build upon. They're not like, oh yeah, we're gonna turn this into an SDK for you. And like, here you go city. Like they're not doing that, right? So it was like, where, if you wanna build something that's gonna last and connect, you have to actually think about how the other systems are built now versus like, 
And so what I realized is that the 3D scanning of places is awesome, but it was like other people are figuring this out. They're obsessed with it. There's Matterport, there's LiDAR scanning. There's, you can do it on your phone now, right? Mm. And so I was like, this is a database, pro- this is a data problem, right? This isn't anything to do with like capturing, like we haven't thought about how to break this data up so that it can talk to other systems and actually be useful. We haven't thought about what formats to put it into so that people can like build layers of information so we can have a real metaverse, right? Because all of these things, they have to like respect what the boundaries of property use, occupancy, city design, like we still live in a physical space and a physical world. So it's like to not build things that connect to that is just bizarre to me. So I just focused for the last four years on occupancy data and like what does it mean to be an occupant what are the different types of occupancy what are the basic things that people who are liable for occupants need to know to make their uh occupancy experience better and really like basic safety is like a huge one and you stop and you look and you're like whoa fire maps are whack like no one can (laughs) No one looks at these, right? And then you realize they're everywhere and you're like, huh, maybe I could replace that, right? Like maybe that, who's doing that? And, and then you, and that's sort of what took, took it to the next level because I realized that buildings and places are all broken up into fire zones. Like every single building is designed and they're split up into that. And I was like, that makes sense to be the next tile size for a map, right? You can't go from like, you know, GPS all the way down to an address to a Matterport scan. Like, where are you going to put the Matterport scan? How are you going to navigate that? That's way too much data. That's like exponentially way too much data to connect to any system. Um, Even like Google doing a 360 photo inside, like what is that? Who's that for, right? Whereas if you're like, actually, we need to know how to get to different parts of this building, how to get in and out of it. Like, there's a lot of things that just people need to know and, and that this way you can actually make a system that makes sense because it's gonna have only four more tiles to an address, which can actually fit now into a geographical database system and, and, and it can connect to delivery systems and last mile delivery and it can uh, give better occupancy um, use and information to both first responders and to city planners. And so it's just like kind of unlocked it all for me. And I realized I was like, oh, I can make this all makes sense by just making a database that takes into account zones, people, and safety fixtures. I can turn this into a system that like, if I turn these parts into digital components, now they can power these other things. You can make these types of people know these things. You can tag these types of people with these dependencies. You can do all this stuff and power all these systems. And so really I found that like risk reduction was the ultimate leverage into making this a reality and getting private enterprises whose information this is a reason to like con- ter- like transform their data into occupancy intelligence. Sure, That's sure. my long-winded intro, sorry. <laughs> Interesting, no, fascinating journey from DJ to disruptive tech and everything in between. Yeah. You've always been on the cutting edge right from day one, it seems. And you're still there. You're still at the cutting edge of, um, you know, immersive technology, um, training technology. So where do you see these technologies going in the future? What sort of impact do you see um, the work that you're doing at at Loki having on the future of training and learning? Yeah, Loki is is really focused on, um, well, it's this focus on making the the connecting to the human brain and actually like really designing something that creates insight in individuals. Um, Just little, little tiny pieces. Like what, what if everybody knew uh, about the places they were about to go in a way that felt like they'd just gone there. Like they just sort of had, had been there. And there is this amazing discovery um, of the GPS of the brain uh, in 2014, uh, the Moser twi- uh, the, the Mosers and uh, Dr. John O'Keefe won the Nobel Prize in medicine for this discovery. Um, and so there's place cells which fire when you uh, see something on the horizon or there's a landmark that you recognize. And there's grid cells that connect them 
And then grid cells are like, they fire as you traverse any terrain, so as you're walking or driving. And uh, those together make these spatial maps. And the first line of code in any memory is where you were, even if you were sound asleep, the, the sort of position you were. And so we have this incredible capacity for memory. Um, and, it, and the method of loci is a, a memory technique that's actually ancient. It's, a, it's over 2,500 years old. Um, and it's still used today by memory champions. And so there's this information that we have. And actually that, the way that they discovered those place and grid cells was through being able to use virtual reality to hook people up to like, to navigate a place without moving because then they could brain, like do brain scans. And so um, this all unlocked this understanding that we actually have this incredible like uh, location, locative learning in our minds. And so uh, my vision for loci is to be able to unlock that like London cab drivers, there was a famous London cabbie study where they discovered that there's like 8% more tissue in the hippocampus of um, cab drivers who have to learn what's called the knowledge, which is understanding the entirety of the London streets, all the backs, alleys and everything like that. And so it's, it's a huge, think, of, think about like storing that whole map in your brain, but um, it's possible. It's like the hippocampus especially is like, it's like a muscle you can work. And uh, ask any memory champion, they'll say the same thing. They're like, oh no, I was just sitting on my ass and I just decided to become a memory champion. It's like, it's, everybody has this capacity. And so what I'm concerned is like this trend that's going on where we're building everything for the phone. And like, it's very, like there's certain things where it's like, tech, we can't tune out to them, like guidance. GPS is a big one. Like, I actually think it's more like as dangerous, if not more dangerous to our minds than social media, because um, it just, when we follow, we're using a completely different part of our brain. We're not paying attention and we're sort of disconnecting our, uh, disorienting ourselves. Um, and we're losing this capacity to orient ourselves in the process. And in doing that, we are actually making it harder for us to store memories as well. So we're not really gonna be able to like complex thought solving problems means you can't be in a reactionary state. You have to be able to study different elements of things. As you know, you're studying all these different elements of the future and then you need to be able to connect those dots. And if you don't have a way to store information in your brain, if you're just like have a shitty desktop that's just covered in stuff and you have a million tabs open, like your brain can't work properly. And this is kind of the reality that we're creating for people, it's like these really busy information overload, get your reaction, your attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. And it's like, we're building this and living in it. And safety has this sort of similar element that it's sort of taken this path where we're like, we need sensors. Oh, we need people to be able to like, use their phones to get out in an emergency. And you're like, that is the, that's a very bad idea. Like cities are now designing like padded poles and like, things like lowering the speed limits because of distracted pedestrians. And it's just so dangerous. Like this is a really, we're optimizing in the complete wrong way for public safety, public togetherness, connection to space. If we're saying you have to learn everything and know where to go and what to do through your phone. And it's not just GPS, right? It's like, it's like again, it's safety things. It's, it's learning things. And so I realize I'm making learning games for the phone, but they're designed so you put your phone away. The design so that like you're heading to the airport, like United is like at gate four and you're in the Uber. And as soon as they see that you're there, they're like, or even maybe when you bought the ticket, but as soon as they know the gate, you get an alert. It's like, hey, Joe, here's this gate. Here's where security is. There's a Starbucks along the way, right? Like here's the fly through there. So you just know what your walk's gonna be. So you're not like standing on the curb like in, a-hole with your phone out like just blocking everything like it's a it's a building planners city planners nightmare to have people on their phones mm. and so what like what i'm trying to do is create these micro learning experiences where you know ahead of time right now i'm starting with sort of large occupancy privately owned liable properties um and and, and schools and things like that but the goal is to do it for entire cities, like just to download and build our own uh, 
GPS that's really all focused on actually showing content from there, not putting people into these 3D spaces. Mm. Like this is a big thing that I think VR AR kind of has not got yet is like the change in behavior required to navigate these spaces. You're like, oh yeah, just use WASD and your cursor and people are like, what the actual is going on? Like my, my computer, give it back to me. Like they just can't handle it, right? It's crazy. And it's like, they're like, oh yeah, now just click through these dots and everybody's trying to make everybody go into these 3D spaces. But I'm like, let these 3D spaces tell people what they need to know. Mm. And it turns out they only need to know like a little tiny bit of information, like a fly through to where they're going, right? Mm -hmm. And so what what I'm, I see in the loci future is that everybody just has like, maybe like not, maybe there's people that just always wanna tune out and have their phone tell them to do this, probably very likely, right? But maybe people are like, oh, it's way like sexier to know what to do and where to go. Like, I'd rather not take the absolute longest route to my seat at a stadium and feel like an idiot when I get mm -hmm. there. Because we've all done things like that, where we're like, oh my God, that was the gate, right? And we just taken the longest way. And so those kinds of situations where we just all like, we've all accepted it. Like, everybody's already paying for it. Like 80% of trucks that are out for delivery are stopped. It's not a traffic problem. It's like people don't know where to go problem, mm. right? So I'm like, until we figure out how to communicate these little pieces of information that don't overwhelm people, that don't make people, people have to like put on a VR headset, but that just use this new 3D environment to teach us really cool things at the right time, then how will that change how we interact with each other? How will that change how we interact with our spaces? How will our minds work differently? Because that's like the biggest thing I see is like, I see a huge shift in behavior where you are way more cognizant of the place you live, the places you go. Mm -hmm. But what sort of impact do you think other technologies will have on that? Because, um, you know, I can see what you're saying about how if people are constantly looking at their phones, they're distracted, they're not paying attention. But potentially in the future, phones could be replaced by smart glasses, uh, AR technology, and so on and so forth. So do you think yeah. the, the need will still be there if people are getting directions directly in front of them on the street? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I still think like, I mean, I think AR overlays will be really cool, but I still think that there's going to be like, there's actually still a, tr a huge trend that I see. And I, I mean, I physically witness all my friends who buy VR and never use it. Um, and, and I'm sure that, you know, I saw people, you know, wear snaps and then not use it. Like, I think that people really underestimate the behavior change it requires. And I do think that people fundamentally just want to be a little bit more connected to each other. So ideally you're pulling out your phone to take a picture or you're pulling out your phone to do a thing, but it's not telling you where to go because I think we can decide there'll be people who decide as a humanity that they like want to be better. Like there's people building brain interfaces and things like that, where it's like, if you're going to have a neural link, like it's, a, is it going to hook up to a hot mess? Like, is it, is it, or are your thoughts going to be loud and intentional? Cause obviously like you, there, there's really loud thoughts. Um, but then like how you store things, everything like that. Like, I think we kind of forget that we have a supercomputer in our head and it needs to function for us all to function. And so I think that even if we have glasses, there'll be, maybe we use the glasses to like pre-visualize the route and then you just are in your present environment, right? Because I don't think anything will ever like make you safer than you just paying attention, right? Like, unless you're in the dark and you're wearing like, you know, night vision goggles or things like that, just like generally walking around a city, like I just don't believe that having glasses and everybody having glasses will actually make people more alert to their surroundings because when you design these kinds of systems, they're always optimizing for a certain thing. It's to get you to your route. They're not like, you know, and like, oh, maybe they can take live data that somebody's reported. There's a car on the shoulder of the road or something like that. This is never gonna be the same as being alert. And I think that we have to kind of at least give people the option for both and not just be like, oh, well, we're gonna have these glasses and then the GPS won't be as dangerous, but it's like, no, it's already really dangerous. And we're thinking that just because we'll have a little bit more field of view 
that tuning out isn't the dangerous part, that, that, that the field of vision is somehow the dangerous part and not the fact that you're putting your trust in your brain in a completely different department that's just like, you know, like follow, that's, that's the issue. Yeah, I completely see where you're coming from. And, and I would completely agree with you that with these technologies, it's really important to make sure that we're using them to augment our human abilities and um, train us to be better and enhance us rather than just outsourcing these parts of our brain or these yeah. ways that we go about our day to day life to technology and then becoming, um, you know, redundant in our own abilities. So I think that that's what it all comes down to. Just picture, say, imagine um, a magic genie came along, right? And it could grant you a wish and your vision for the future. Um, if everyone was much more aware of their surroundings, um, just like you, you were talking about, how, how do you envision the future or what's your like ideal future where um, everyone took on that advice and the world was slightly different? How do you see that future? I think like the, the, the first use case that touched my heart for just like me imagining a future was like thinking about people growing up in neighborhoods and not knowing that they could maybe rent that pizza shop down the road, that that was even possible or that that was needed, right? Or that they could, that they they knew kind of, that, that people would feel so connected to their neighborhoods and to the cities and the places that they were in and the, and the places they'd spent time in, that they'd see themselves in them, that they'd realize that, oh, this person who runs a shop is just like me. And they'd invest more in their communities because they see this sort of divergence to uh, putting a lot of effort into our personal brands and these things like that um, versus having a connection to the places around us that support us and nurture us and have a direct impact on us. And um, I'm hoping that just if a generation grows up with loci that you just see a lot more thriving neighborhoods and a lot more uh, connection to community. Fantastic. That was great. But we are just getting a bit short for time. So to finish up, would you like to tell us a little bit about your participation in the Sendai framework that you've been taking part in recently? Yeah, cool. I was just in um, working with the yeah, Sendai City in Japan, and um, it was a program through JETRO, which is the Japanese Board of Trade. And Japanese such a, Japan has such an interesting uh, risk landscape, like it has it all. <laughs> and they have done a lot of work to obviously like solve for this, and they've thought about it a lot more than other developed nations have, and they've created a really uh, incredible framework that's designed for other cities to adopt or just, you know, take uh, pieces of, so depending on, on what their risk landscape are, but to actually help reach sustainable development goals. Because I think we kind of, especially in tech, we get all excited about all this like crazy future stuff. And we forget that there's just like really basic infrastructure that's super broken or like needs work. And like, I really hope that we can make infrastructure hot and sexy to young people who are interested in an emerging future because um, places like Japan where you have nuclear power, you have earthquakes, you have flooding, you have tsunamis, you have all these different things like that, but you have a thriving economy and a thriving city and like in a lot of ways, a lot of like sort of travel systems, things that are way more advanced than ours. And so there's a, like a lot we can learn from that. And so I was excited because I noticed a huge issue, especially in the pandemic with how cities and public health orders are given out because we have this very like, oh, here's a PDF kind of thing. And it's still like, it's just digital paper. It's like really challenging. Like we haven't done anything great here and it's hard to know who understands what. And like the, the feedback data that you get from who understands what is like hospital data. That's like really too far down the line to like understand who's understanding. And like, um, we, I'm hoping that through working with Sendai City that we can sort of create some sort of basic infrastructure for cities where we're not seen as like a private company, but that any city could adopt a framework like ours where 
it's just a, a, a learning management system for all of your constituents. It's just a way to kind of send out information to people that isn't a stale uh, file format that like people have to interact with. So you understand what they are understanding. If they like are playing a germ safety game and they get half the answers wrong, maybe you can focus a little bit more of your messaging in that area or in that demographic or in that neighborhood. And so um, I really was impressed with what Japan's doing on the infrastructure side, but I still think that like, I haven't seen anybody doing um, big leaps and bounds in the communication side in terms of like how they get feedback on their campaigns um, from public health messages to safety to anything like that. And right now, sort of the best that we're doing is, is signs. And uh, this is leaving out people with reading abilities, people who speak other languages. This is leaving out people who don't see that a new order has been posted, right? And this is like a huge issue that we are living through right now. And so I hope that through participating now with like bigger cities and frameworks like Sendai, we can start to sort of update, not just like how we approach risk from like building, you know, container walls and things like that, but how we approach risk like through people and who we're actually, maybe we can start looking at who we're leaving behind from the basics of safety. Cause it's like, that's the bottom of Maslow's triangle. If we can't achieve safety for people across the globe, like I don't think we're going to achieve the other things, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That all sounds really interesting. It sounds like a, a great um, project to be a part of. What a great way to finish up. Thanks a lot, Thank Sam. You. It's been really, uh, uh, really great. Such a pleasure. I'll hour. come back anytime. It was great talking to you. Thank you. And that just about wraps up the episode. Thank you so much for staying till the end. I really appreciate it. But before you go, make sure to follow Lokai on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle Learn by Lokai. That's L E A R N B Y L O C I. You can also find them on LinkedIn with the same handle Learn by Lokai. I'd highly recommend you check out their content. And also, don't forget to follow Sam on Twitter. It's at Sam Lokai. And on LinkedIn, um, under the handle Samantha Matthews Loci. Thanks again for staying till the end of the episode. Make sure to follow and stay up to date with our future content. Have a great day and I'll see you again soon.